All right, it's just a little bit after 5.30, so we are going to go ahead and get started tonight. Hello, everyone. My name is Sarah Strew. I'm the lead for Nature Camp and Adult Programs here at VINS. I want to thank you all so much for tuning in tonight. Uh, at the Vermont Institute of Natural Science, our mission is to motivate and inspire individuals and communities to care about the natural world. Um, we do that through avian rehabilitation, research, and environmental education. So we are a nonprofit organization, um, and we are so grateful for uh, your participation in this event, as well as for the financial support um, from those of you who donated. So um, thank you all, um, whether or not you made a donation um, prior to coming and joining us tonight. Um, we are glad that you are here. Uh, this is such a wonderful turnout um, for this evening's event. And I know that I speak for all of our presenters tonight um, when I say we're really thrilled with the level of interest in this really important and pretty timely topic. Um, I don't think we could have asked for better timing, actually. Um, I'm sure many of you have um, at least heard about the most recent report that came out of the World Health Organization um, this week on the origins of COVID-19, um, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So um, our hope tonight is really that this discussion will give you uh, a deeper understanding about uh, really the interconnectedness of human communities with the wildlife that we share space with. Um, also, an understanding of some of the conservation issues facing bats right now in particular, as well as, you know, some reasons for hope, um, some really great examples of how humans can have a very positive impact on the natural world. Before we um, turn things over to our presenters, and I want to go over a few little etiquette reminders, as you'll see on the screen in front of you. Um, please do um, keep yourself muted um, during the presentations. Um, if you do have questions, we welcome them. Use that chat feature um, that you have access to um, and send your questions in. Our moderator tonight, um, Kim Holland, an environmental educator at VINS, is going to be monitoring that um, chat feature. So she'll be recording questions. Um, if there are clarifying questions or things like that, she's going to uh, ask those in real time so you get those um, things that you might be confused about or wondering about right then and there answered. And then she's gonna also compile questions for our question and answer session that we're gonna be having at the very end. Um, if you want to have your video off, that's fine. If you want it on, also fine. Please do keep down the distractions in the background. We are going to be recording this event. And so that might determine whether you want to have your video on or off. I don't know. Um, and then lastly, we, um, we have the camera. want it's to, so okay. Um, we want to remind you that this is um, set up as part of a series, and so if you're able to, um, we're yeah, we can to hear you to anything. join us on Thursday, April 15th at 530 um, for a second part of this conversation, which is going to be focused uh, much more in depth on the rehab process and um, protocols that are in place and a behind the scenes tour of uh, the Vermont Bad Center. So. Um, very briefly, before I turn things over entirely to our first presenter, I do want to introduce our panelists for tonight, um, our presenters, um, if they will, um, really briefly after I um, call you out, if you will uh, unmute and just uh, give a quick introduction to yourself and your area of expertise, which you're going to be um, diving into this evening. That would be great. And so uh, first is Bill Kilpatrick, a professor of biology at, at UVM. So I'm actually a professor of biology emeritus, meaning I'm supposedly retired. 
Um, I'm still quite active with re research and presentations. I'm not teaching any longer. And I hope to introduce you a little bit to uh, um, viral diversity, uh, what we know about uh, reservoirs of, of various viruses, especially those associated with COVID-19, uh, how we think the transmission has occurred, what the World Health Organization recent reports adds to that, which is not much, um, but uh, kind of give you an idea of, of the uh, controversy, the um, um, depth of knowledge, the lack of knowledge that we have on this subject. Thank you. Uh, next is Alyssa Bennett, a biologist with Vermont Fish and Wildlife. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm going to be providing a background on the bats of Vermont, some of the threats that they face, and some of the management actions and conservation measures that we take to address some of those threats. And then we have uh, Meg Lout with Vermont Agency of Transportation, a biologist and bat specialist. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'll be talking about some of the really beneficial and exemplary projects that BTRANS has worked on in terms of bat conservation and also some of the collaboration and um, conservation efforts that we've put forth with a team of biologists from um, Vermont Fish and Wildlife and also other agencies. Thank you. And then um, lastly is Barry Genslinger, president of the Vermont Bat Center. Thanks for having me. This is very exciting and I have to be on my best behavior because uh, Meg Lout is one of our board members. So I gotta watch out what I say. Uh, I am the president of Vermont Bat Center. Uh, we take in orphaned and injured and sick and displaced bats from all over Vermont. Uh, I am a licensed bat rehabber with a license for all nine species of bats in Vermont. Um, Vermont Bat Center is a 501c3 organization. I'm, I'm the retired and former owner of Chiroptera Cabin Company, where we made bat houses. And my wife and I uh, would make bat houses and sell them all over the place. We got sick of making bat houses after we shipped our 4,000th bat house. So we decided to retire and let somebody else do it. Fantastic. All right, um, so this evening, um, each of those panelists you just met is going to um, have about 10 minutes or so um, to speak on their area of expertise. And then, as I mentioned, we are gonna have about 15 minutes at the end um, for a question and answer session. So definitely stick around um, and uh, please do use that chat feature um, again, we have Kim who will be monitoring that and compiling questions and um, feeding those back um, either as needed or at the very end. And so right now I am going to hand things over to Dr. Kil, uh, Dr. Kilpatrick. And I'm going to stop this share and pull up him. Well, I'll go ahead and get started while she's uh, loading my slides. Um, yeah, back one slide. Yeah, there we go. So um, emerging infectious diseases like uh, Lyme, uh, hantavirus, uh, like Ebola, like COVID-19 are all quite familiar to you now. And these are all um, viral diseases that were transmitted from wildlife into humans. And first, I want to talk to you a little bit about what we know about viruses, which is really relatively little. We estimate there's, there's about 100 million species of viruses in the world, and mammals are thought to play a role as the reservoir for about 320,000 viral species. Of that, about 220 species are known to infect humans. It's not surprising that the two orders of mammals with the greatest species diversity also serve as the reservoir for the greatest number of viral species. So these are rodents, 
with over 2,500 species. And you can see there in the first bar diagram, the great diversity of families of viruses that rodents host. We don't know the number of viral species that actually occur in, in rodents, but we know that they house a great diversity of different types of viruses. Likewise, with nearly 1,400 species of living bats, we estimate the number of viruses that occur in bats at roughly 3,000. And again, looking at the other pie diagram, you can see again that there's a great diversity in the number of different families of viruses for which bats are the reservoir. In a recent uh, analysis of our largest living bat, Europus giganticus, that you see up in the top corner, it was found that this bat was a reservoir for 55 different viral species related to nine different families of viruses. We can go to the next slide. So if we uh, focus in, next slide. There we go. If we focus in on the coronaviruses, which uh, are familiar to most of us today, oops, back one. Um, if we find that there are four different lineages of coronaviruses, as you can see in the tree. These are usually recognized as different genera, the alpha coronavirus and the beta coronaviruses. The reservoirs for those are all mammals. Whereas the Delta coronaviruses, the host reservoir is primarily birds. Although at least one species of uh, Delta coronavirus is found in pigs. The host for the Gamma coronaviruses are marine mammals and birds. Seven different coronaviruses are known from humans. Four of which are low pathogenic, that is, these are viruses that cause the common cold. These are both alpha and beta coronaviruses. And you can see the reservoir for two of them are rodents, and the reservoir for two others are for ba are bats. There are three highly pathogenic, all causing severe acute respiratory syndromes, uh, like COVID-19, and these are all beta coronaviruses, they are all thought to have their primary reservoir species in some species of bat or more than a single species of bat. Interesting, prior to 2003, the first outbreak of SARS-CoV-1, only 19 coronaviruses were known. Two of these were known from humans, 13 from other species of mammals, and four from birds. Coronaviruses occur in bats on all continents on which bats occur, including North America. In North America, we have the Rocket Mountain Bat Coronavirus, which is an alpha coronavirus, which occurs or has been recovered from big brown bats at Tethyscus fuscus, one of our local species, and the occult myotis, uh, the southern relative and a close relative of our little brown bat. If we can go on to the next slide. So bats certainly are a reservoir for viruses. However, that's not their only ecological role. I'm sure other people will talk more about the ecological roles that bats uh, um, fill, including insect control, important pollinators, and important seed dispersals. In addition, there is no evidence that suggests that bats play a more important role as being a reservoir for viruses than other taxes of mammals. However, they do have a number of characteristics that make them very favorable for viral transmission among bats. One is that they have are very old evolutionary lineages. So there's been a long time for viruses and their um, host 
uh, bat species to co-evolve. In addition, and probably most important, many bat species are quite social and they congregate at large numbers in close proximity of individuals. This is an ideal situation for the transfer of viral particles, uh, aerial transmission of viral particles from individuals to individuals. In addition, many of species of bats hibernate and in doing so, they shut down their immune system. And this no doubt helps some viruses get a good start uh, within a novel host species. What's most important to really think about is what's called viral spillover. This is what causes the transfer of viruses into humans from a host uh, of a different species. And we define viral spillover as a situation where a reservoir species had with a high pathogen or viral prevalence comes in contact with a novel host species. A pathogen then is transmitted to that novel host and it may then either remain only in that individual or it may be transmitted to other individuals within that host, uh, novel host species. And if so, we may end up with another pandemic situation like we had with COVID-19. We now are pretty sure that, that viral spillovers are a fairly common event. About two thirds of all of the viruses that are known in humans are thought to have arisen by viral spillover. We also see that there's clear evidence that we have an increased frequency of viral spillover occurring. And we're going to see increases in the emergence of, of diseases in human populations. There's a lot of causes for this. One of the situations is that the human population is increasing in size. And as a result, we have increased deforestation. We have increased encroachment into wildlife habitat and destruction of wildlife habitat. We have more and more conversion of the land into use for humans, expansion of agriculture. We also then are causing additional stresses on wildlife populations due to overhunting, due to pesticides and other toxins being placed in the environment and just in the globalization that's causing the increase in the number of invasive species and the spread of invasive species throughout the world. I can have my last slide then. Uh, I'll try to finish up very quickly. So what I want to fin up, finish up talking about is a little bit specifically about the SARS COVID-1 and COVID-2 uh, viruses and wildlife. We now have pretty good evidence that rhinolophid or horseshoe bats are the primary reservoirs for both of those viral species. The problem is there's 102 species of rhinolophid bats and they're all in a single genus, meaning they all look pretty much alike and they are very difficult to differentiate in the field. In addition of that 102 species, 25 have been described since 2005. So there's likely many more species that are undescribed. In addition, they occur in all continents of the old world and many of the species are widespread. So there can be a great deal of geographic diversity in the viruses for which they serve as a reservoir. There's been continuous hypothesis about the roles of an intermediate host. I'm not a particular fan of the idea of intermediate host because there's no real strong data for it. So palm or the mass palm civet was proposed as the intermediate host for SARS-CoV-1. Uh, it certainly carries the virus. It's very similar to the human SARS-CoV-1 virus. However, more similar sequences of viruses are found in rhinolophid bats. Likewise, the Malaysian pangolin has been proposed as a intermediate host for SARS-CoV-2, but likewise, there are more similar viruses 
uh, to SARS-CoV-2, human SARS-CoV-2 found in rhinolophid bats. The World Health Organization recent report hypothesized that other form raised wild mammals in China likely serve as this intermediate uh, host species. However, that's based almost on entirely no hard data other than China certainly has the practice of farm raising a lot of different wild animal species. And the last thing I wanna end with was the idea of reverse zoonotic transmission. That situation where humans with COVID-19 transmit SARS-CoV-2 to animal species. We know this has occurred among felids, including house cats, lions and tigers and zoos, at least one puma and dogs. In addition, mink forms, uh, American mink, uh, genus Dingo bison, both in North America and Europe have had COVID-19 uh, transmitted or SARS-CoV-2 transmitted from infected humans to those animals. In the case of the felids and in dogs, there is no evidence that the individuals or the animals infected there with SARS-CoV-2 are capable of transmitting it to other humans. That's not true of the American mink in the mink form. There is strong evidence in Europe that those mink have given SARS-CoV-2 to previously uninfected humans. I'm sure some of the other speakers tonight are going to talk a little bit about some of the practices that were put in place to protect our local bats from this reverse zoonotic transmission of SARS-CoV-2. And I'd be happy to take any question at this time. Wonderful. We have one clarifying question for you. Um, someone wanted to know, Quentin Blaine asks, how does the virus jump from bats to humans? So could you give us a little bit more information about how a virus makes that transition between hosts? Yeah, so in, it, it occurs by different ways. So in some cases, it's carried out via a, a vector, like a mosquito. So that certainly is a common way which virus move from one host or a reservoir into a novel host. That doesn't appear to be the case in, in SARS-CoV-2. Here, the predominant idea is that it is coming then from what we might want to refer to as bushmeat or in exotic animals that are being harvested and butchered, et cetera, and thereby with the lack of hygiene or undercooked food, the virus being transferred from that host species or reservoir into a human population. Wonderful, that was all that we have for right now. Thank you so much, Dr. Kilpatrick. Thank you. Okay, um, next up is Alyssa Bennett. I'm gonna stop my sharing so that you can take over the screen, Alyssa. Thank you. And um, I have been told that uh, turning my video off sometimes helps if people have slow internet access or anything. So I'm just gonna turn that off in the background. But I will share my screen and if you can let me know when you do see it in just a second. That would be great. And are you able to see the first slide? You are all set. Great. So my role in this uh, great panel of experts here is to provide a background on Vermont bats because most of the work that I do has to do with, um, with their populations in Vermont. So this is very Vermont specific. I will provide you some background some background information here. As you can see in this photo, uh, bats used to be pretty widespread in Vermont, but there are a number of threats that have changed the population status of some of these species. These are little brown bats that are circling in the air in what we call a fall swarm period when they gather to breed in the fall. As Bill mentioned, these 
these uh, different species of bats we have are very beneficial in many ways. And in Vermont, the species of bats we have are all insect eaters. And it turns out they are, are actually foraging on insects that can be uh, pests to agriculture and our forest industry. So there's a great benefit there in economic terms and also in terms of uh, pests to people as well. In fact, bats can eat a lot of insects every night one bat, a lactating female in the summer when she's raising her pup, can eat up to her entire weight in insects in one night. And you can see here on the screen that we have things like the emerald ash borer in the middle, which there's evidence that big brown bats actually have been known to eat that species. So some very interesting things. If you didn't already know, we have nine different species of bats in Vermont. Over in the square on the left, you can see six species that all hibernate for the winter. So we call these our cave bat species. And what you'll notice that stands out for those bats as compared to the species in the square on the right, the three which are our longer distance migrating bats, which we call tree bats, is that the species on the left, five of them are actually listed as threatened or endangered. Before white nose syndrome, which is one of the major threats we'll talk about, the Indiana bat and the Eastern small footed bat already had a state and, um, and Indiana bat federal listing. But then since white nose syndrome and because of massive 90% plus declines due to that disease, three additional species in green there were added to our state endangered species list and the Northern long-eared bat then became federally threatened as well. As I mentioned, white nose syndrome is one of the major threats to our bat populations. So here's a photo back when um, this, this disease was originally discovered in New York state and then spread and now is in, I believe, 36 states and seven Canadian provinces. Um, this this uh, fungus appears as a white powdery substance on the nose of bats. It spreads easily between individuals and to the substrate that they're on where they hibernate and back to more bats again. And it causes massive population declines. Within just a few years of arriving out of sight, after the fungus is detected, it does often cause these very same 90 to 95% declines for a number of our really vulnerable species. So if we look at what that uh, appears in terms of population declines over time, you can see big plummets here around 2009, 2010, and then some leveling off. These are mostly little brown bat populations at some of our smaller sites. So you can see by the number of the bats there that uh, a lot of these sites are about a thousand bats or less, but we have the best long-term data on some of these sites. We do have larger sites and luckily one of ours is still holding on with a couple tens of thousands bats living there, but some sites actually have uh, completely lost their bat populations as you can see by some of the lines that zero out here. The good news is that there is some evidence of survival so you can see in here in the picture on the top in A is a bat that was captured earlier in the summer. When they emerge, they have very serious wing tissue damage due to the fungus, which eats right through their skin. But amazingly, many of them do heal up. This is the same bat in the lower photo that was captured later that summer. And you can see that healing process that took place. So we participate in lots of different types of research where we're collecting information like wing swabs here, where we're just looking at how we can gather information about how much, how much fungus is on bats in different caves and mines where they hibernate, what kind of micro habitat is, or sorry, a microbiome is on their wing tissue so that we can understand why some bats get sick and others don't get as sick. This allows us to look at differences in individuals and also in different species where we've seen very different um, effects and declines. One of the other threats that really um, is very apparent <laughs> if you've ever had bats in your house is this idea of cohabitating with wildlife. So we talk about sort of sharing our world with wildlife and often wildlife is really coming into our space as much as we're going into their space. And so we provide a lot of technical assistance for people who have bats living in a structure where they would rather get them safely out and we provide free bat houses for people who have endangered little brown bats. We provide a lot of um, a technical know-how on safely evicting bats from their structures and list of professionals. So if you have bats and structures, that's something you can reach out about. 
We also have a maternity colony monitoring program. So that means through citizen reports, we're able to locate these big congregations of female bats raising their youngs in buildings. And in that way, we have a chance to work with landowners and homeowners to make sure that those bats are not harmed and they're safely evicted if needed to provide alternative habitat and also to watch those populations to see how they're doing over time. As a result of this monitoring, we've been able to watch the population trends. So when we look at select little brown bat maternity colonies where we have good long-term data, and this is all post-whiteness syndrome. So after that crash and decline that you saw in the figure inside our caves and mines with whiteness syndrome, this post-whiteness syndrome monitoring has allowed us to see through all these incredible volunteer counts and homeowner cooperation, that many of these colonies are not only stable, but in some cases, even increasing at a very slight rate. We do have some anomalies sometimes where we might have seen um, some other events that we can't characterize like the Shelburne site on the top here. But overall, we're seeing a pretty stable trend for little brown bats, which has been um, definitely backed up in many ways through some other research we participate in that's recently been published that suggests that there are some really interesting underlying genetic factors that are present in bats who are surviving white nose syndrome that have to do with things like hibernation behavior and maybe helping these bats to pass this survivorship on to their young. Little brown bats are persisting, as I mentioned, and this is pretty exciting when we think about it. So unfortunately, this trend is not necessarily the same for all of our species. The little brown bats do seem really uniquely dependent on humans though. And I think that's very important to point out that we can have an incredibly important impact to this species because they really prefer to roost in human-made human structures. And that gives us this unique opportunity to really have a big important role in their conservation. One of the other threats, and this is to our long distance migratory species that I mentioned in the beginning, they do not hibernate in the winter and do not appear to be affected by white nose syndrome, but wind energy development is something that affects these species, this suite of species. They seem uniquely vulnerable because of likely their migratory paths along these ridge lines. So Vermont has a very strict curtailment protocol, which we require through all of these facilities, which are permitted in Vermont. And that reduces very substantially the amount of take that happens at these facilities. This is not true of, of all states or all areas where wind development happens. So Vermont really has tried to be a leader in this case. In addition to that, we also require that um, as part of that permit that these companies uh, provide some assistance to this um, maternity colony assistance program, technical assistance program, we call it. And so that is actually what funds the work that we do to help homeowners when they have bats living in their structures. And so compared to the small number of bats that is killed at wind facilities, there are hundreds and actually thousands of bats just in Vermont that benefit from this mitigation program. We also have some human disturbance uh, that's considered to be a big threat. Sometimes this is really massive for bats which concentrate and are very vulnerable in the winter. This is a site where we actually have um, prior to white nose, likely somewhere between 300 and 500,000 bats were hibernating. And now we estimate a population of about 70 to 90,000 bats, which is the largest concentration we know of of hibernating bats in the in entirety of New England and um, possibly the Northeast. And this is a site that we have gated and we often put signs at sites like this. So this is actually a conserved area, but there are other sites that are on private lands and we work with private landowners to put in these bat friendly gates that bats can get in and out of, but people cannot. And that does seem to have, in some cases, a very dramatic impact on bats. So you can see here, one of the sites where a bat friendly gate was installed. Historically, there had been a pretty high count at the site, likely before many people knew about it. But then it quickly became a very popular destination for people to go and do some great underground exploration. In fact, whole, whole summer camps of people would go into these sites and explorers go in there in the fall and the winter. It's really nice and warm underground where bats are hibernating compared to the outdoor winter weather in Vermont. But this is not necessarily good for the bats who are trying to make it through the winter without being aroused from hibernation. So you can see here an example of a bat friendly gate being installed in 2004 and that 
population started to increase until white nose syndrome hit, unfortunately, and that's when you see another drop there in 2010, I think that is. But then that population has, has been slowly increasing again, and that is something that we tend to see more at our protected gated sites. One of the other threats that comes up is this idea of habitat loss, whether that's through development or what we would call conversion of habitat to another use, so loss of that habitat, or if that comes up because of some type of normal forest management activity, that gives us another opportunity to address a threat. And here you can see that when bats are actually roosting in trees or buildings or rocky areas, they tend to have a whole network of roosts that they switch between every couple of days. And the thing to keep in mind here is depending on where habitat loss happens, bats who are very long lived and very uh, have very high site fidelity, meaning they come back to the same locations year after year, if they returned in those areas that are circled in yellow, had been converted to another use or cleared for some reason, there's a good chance that they would have lost the majority of their known roosts. And they would spend a lot of energy in the spring when they're trying to, um, to go through their pregnancy period looking for, for new roosts to replace the lost roosts. So it's about just thinking about what this looks like on, on a broader scale. So when we think about what's important to bats, we're considering forest patches, but also things like edge habitat where bats forage. So we don't have to conserve every tree. It's just about this kind of intelligent management over time and using information we know about where bats actually are, known roost location, known hibernation locations, and prioritizing those areas. Because when you have places like agricultural areas, which you can see down on the lower right here, they actually can be beneficial to species like Indiana bats, which use a matrix of open areas to forage along the edge of, and then forested patches to roost within. Any types of water bodies are generally beneficial to bats, which means we have to consider how important clean water is for species like this. And riparian buffers, which means leaving vegetation around the edges of places like this are important for the water quality and also important to provide bats protection when they're foraging. We can also think about habitat management in terms of roosting habitat directly. So that means looking around your own property and thinking about trees that you have that have cavities, crevices, cracks, and peeling bark. And those can be great for a number of different bat species to roost in. They love to squeeze into those places, as well as bat houses and finding a well-designed one. Bats are very fascinating. And in fact, they even we even have specialists that like to roost in rock crevices, talus, and ledges. So there are two bats in this photo that you can see. This was in about a 10 centimeter hole that I could see a slot between two pieces of slate where these bats were roosting, eastern small-footed bats. When we're thinking about the current population trends from uh, what happened when we had the initial white nose syndrome declines to now the last decade or so since those declines, you can see on the left, when you're looking at the arrow, I made the arrow length or size in terms of that vertical size, proportional about to what those population declines were. So big brown bats, as you can see, and Eastern small-footed bats, smaller proportional declines initially that were measured, mostly from hibernaculus survey data where people were counting bats underground. Whereas Indiana, Northern long-eared bats, little brown and tricolors all saw much bigger declines. Indianas were not as severe in the beginning, maybe around 65%. Unfortunately, when you look over at the right in the green square, you can see that our post white nose population trends, some of which are, you know, are, are a little bit of speculation there, especially where I put a question mark, the Indiana bat continues to decline range wide. So that has been a concern. Whereas little brown bats appear to be stabilizing down on the bottom right. And we just don't know as much, especially in Vermont, about northern long bats and tricolored bats because they're so rare at this point. But there is a chance that big browns and eastern small-footed bats who we've been counting more of, especially in underground spaces, could potentially be doing okay post white nose syndrome. And finally, in terms of COVID-19 and the impact that this has had to the conservation work that we do, it definitely has meant that we postponed all of our bat handling work last summer and we are planning to do that again this summer because we're going with this idea that the CDC has put out in terms of humans working with wildlife and being concerned still without enough information about whether we could potentially transmit this virus to bats. We're looking at what would be the most effective ways 
to reduce that potential risk. And you can see at the top there, elimination and substitution. And so in this case, we're postponing any of our capture work we would, where we would handle bats. And instead we're substituting uh, for that survey work, we're putting more time into our acoustic work where we are out listening for bats where we can detect a lot of different species and a lot of roost watching. So looking for bats exiting buildings and trees so we can get information about their colony size and their roost use. And that is all I have. So I'm just gonna go to stop sharing. Awesome, so we have a couple of questions for you, Alyssa, that I think would be helpful to address right now. Um, and so Kathy Keenan, had a question about the roost trees um, and he mentioned that it's the pregnant bats um, and she was wondering do the pregnant bats move every three days and do male bats roost separately? Male bats do generally roost separately um, and, and sometimes with one or two other males sometimes with a non-reproductive female but generally separately and don't gather in those large groups. Maternity colonies can be anywhere from, depending on the species, a couple bats up to a couple hundred bats, um, a couple thousand before white nose syndrome for little browns. And yes, the roost switching on average might be about three or four days for most of our species. Um, sometimes they're moving around every day, sometimes every seven days. So that's probably an average. Awesome. Um, and let me see if there's Maybe one more, and then I'll save the others for our Q and A. Do you have any advice on where someone could place a box on their property, um, or any organizations um, that you know personally of that you would promote? Bat Conservation International has great information on bat house placement and design. And they um, can point you to the fact that a lot of people who build bat houses out there are BCI certified, they call it. And that's a great way to determine whether you're buying a bat house that meets those research tested criteria, which I'm sure Barry could talk more about. Wonderful, thank you. All right, we will move along to um, Meg, Meg Lout, you are up. Um, let's see here. Uh, hopefully, I can get this right again. Does that We're look seeing okay? your screen. Excellent. And I apologize in advance. Um, my dog is about to be taken out for her walk, so it might get a little noisy with excitement on this end. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so yes, I'm here to talk about VTRANS and um, how we target a lot of our work based on avoiding and minimizing and mitigating, excuse me, and mitigating um, for bats and what we can do best to conserve our bat species. So just a little overview of what I'll be talking about is the regulatory framework and the environmental policies um, under which we typically use to determine the risk to any given bat species. And um, I'd also like to talk about some of VTRAN's environmental commitments to bat conservation um, that drives a lot of how we operate and um, manage our projects. And then some representative projects that were particularly exciting from last year. Uh, Alyssa had mentioned that because there wasn't any handling, a lot of people ramped up their acoustic monitoring, which is what VTRAN's did. Um, and then I also wanna talk about a couple of representative projects that have ongoing and future mitigation that um, are very promising for bats. So for regulatory framework and environmental policy, we essentially follow the state and federal endangered species act. Um, we follow both of them because each of them are slightly different and when coupled together, we are as conservative as we can possibly be. And we also work under the national environmental policy act. Um, and the way that we do that, um, essentially we use these two tools that are available to us. And there's the information planning and conservation portal, which is for the Fish and Wildlife Service. And then Vermont also has another similar resource in the Natural Resources Atlas. Um, this picture on the right is a picture of a culvert replacement um, in Leicester, Vermont, that we conducted some acoustic monitoring at and had a tremendous amount of Indiana bat and little brown bat activity. And it's also an area where northern long-eared bats have been detected in the past. Um, so just an example of what our assessment looks like when we're looking at risk. That yellow dot there is the location of the project. And 
Um, Otter, Otter Creek is green just because that's indicating that there's um, an endangered species that lives in there. But you can see the red circles and the green circles generally give you an idea of um, wh which species are in the area of your project and you can read about them and then determine how to best move forward with um, avoiding and minimizing and mitigating for any impacts. And once we know which species we have to deal with or we are dealing with, um, we use two different documents essentially to determine how we're gonna mitigate and move forward or just avoid any kind of impacts altogether. One of them is the federal guidance um, for Indiana bats, which is also used for Northern long-eared bats. And the other one is specific to Vermont, which is um, particularly related to Northern long-eared bats. Um, and there, it's very detailed and laid out in different circumstances and time of year and the type of area the Northern long-eared bats are using and how they're using it. So it's, it's a lot of information, but that's just sort of what we put into the equation of how we're assessing impacts. And for our environmental commitments to bat conservation, um, DTRANS will always comply with both state and federal regulations, which as I mentioned, is the most conservative approach. Um, there's also a project being funded at Virginia Tech and a graduate student is um, producing this Northern long eared Bat Occupancy Modeling. And VTRANS has taken um, the lead in ramping up funding for that. And so we also increased our survey effort last summer and we'll be providing data from the previous five years as will a lot of, of other DOTs in the Northeast and provide that data to this graduate student who will then be able to determine where Northern long eared bats are on the landscape. So instead of having this range wide approach and implementing um, these particularly strict sometimes um, regulations at projects, it will allow us to really target where this species is found. And as Alyssa said, it's one of our rarest bats. So this is very exciting and it's very important to VTRANS as it is to a lot of other DOTs and agencies. Um, VTRANS for all transportation projects, um, whether it's um, ledge removal to widen a road or it's a culvert replacement or replacing a bridge deck, um, we will either conduct a survey to determine whether which bats are present or not. And if we can't, we will always institute time of year restrictions so that trees won't be cut or ledge won't be removed, which is um, a type of habitat that our Eastern small-footed bat would typically use. And um, we will always err on the side of caution. So we either proactively survey or else we'll institute time of year restrictions for tree clearing or any other um, potential effect to any suitable habitat. We also partner with Vermont Fish and Wildlife and the Fish and Wildlife Service on all of our projects. And we don't typically just target all of the federally listed species. We're targeting all of the nine uh, Vermont bat species that Alyssa had talked about. And um, something that Vermont Fish and Wildlife is initiating that VTRANS is very excited and delighted about being able to assist with is um, they're going to be developing a map of not just where our threatened and endangered species occur, but also where our migratory tree bats have been detected and confirmed present. So that um, similar to how white nose syndrome came across the landscape and decimated uh, a lot of our bat populations. And there's a lot of data that wasn't recorded because they were so common, we never anticipated that we would ever be in such a, a dire situation. So um, just being proactive, we're able to support our state's effort to try and map out where all of our bats are so that we have more information should any event like that or should wind facilities, as um, Alyssa had mentioned, really start to impact our bats. So our 2020 survey effort, we decided to conduct surveys at 38 of our transportation sites, and they were all scattered throughout Vermont. This is a map on the left of all the survey locations. They sort of blend together just because at this scale, uh, some of them are so close, you can't really tell them apart. And very excitingly, we detected northern long-eared bats at six sites where the species has not been detected before. We also detected Indiana bats at five sites. The tricolored bat, which is one of the species that Alyssa had mentioned had been, has been hit pretty hard by white nose syndrome. And just an aside for the tricolored bat, uh, we rarely ever detect them. And if we do detect them, it's usually like one call, but um, we detected them at three sites and one of them had six calls, which is really promising for us. We are excited about it. So that's big news. Um, little brown bats who seem to be showing some promise that they might be recovering, we detected at 34 sites. And the eastern small-footed bat, uh, we detected at one site. That picture to the right there is what, um, so if you can imagine a microphone pointing out and showing the, like pointing towards the area it's surveying, that's the airspace that was being surveyed. So um, one other exciting thing about this site, not only did we detect the eastern small-footed bat here, um, we also detected a substantial amount of little brown bat activity and Vermont Fish and Wildlife might be looking into trying to find whether there's a maternity colony nearby. 
So going back to our northern long-eared bat detections, this is a map of all the locations where we detected them last summer, with the exception of Middlebury, just sort of in the middle. Um, we detected northern long-eared bats in Middlebury at one of our um, bigger projects that I'll talk about later. Uh, we did not detect them acoustically this summer, but um, we have some exciting uh, mitigation moving forward at that project site. So here's a picture of the Middlebury Bridge and Rail Project. Um, in a nutshell, there are two deteriorating rail bridges that needed to be replaced and they were being replaced by some, a tunnel. Surveys that we did indicated that there were bats roosting in this bridge. Um, unfortunately, there was an emergency declaration and it had to come down before we could actually capture the bats that were flying out of them. Um, in addition to this, there's tree clearing associated with the project. So these unavoidable um, impacts of loss of bridge roosting and tree roosting habitat um, gave us a really good opportunity to mitigate to the maximum extent practicable. Um, so initially we conducted acoustic monitoring and then we determined that there were probably several species of concern that um, we really wanted to confirm. Some bat calls can overlap and so it's really hard to tell sometimes unless you have the bat in your hand. So um, you can see the picture on the left is a picture of a mist net and that's one of several that were put up. The picture on the right is a picture of a bat that uh, was captured. And just um, I'll follow up on this later, but this was a very big effort um, between a consulting firm, VHB, who I worked with during this time, VTrans for Mop Fish and Wildlife. Barry from the Bat Center was there. And um, it was really just a really good example of a lot of people working together to really do the best job that we can and get the most out of what we're doing. So we transmitted five northern long-eared bats and they flew to a lot of these houses. And it turns out this project, we um, were able to document the largest little brown bat um, maternity colony, which is in the upper right-hand corner. There was approximately 550 bats counted flying out of this house. I'm not sure how the homeowner still feels about that, but um, it was a really exciting opportunity and just the enthusiasm between VTrans and Vermont Fish and Wildlife and VHB's excitement to support the effort. Um, we misnetted there voluntarily and were able to capture a lot of little brown bats. We captured um, a juvenile eastern red bat too, which is one of our, our migratory tree bats. So that was really exciting. So um, moving on to the middle mitigation at Middlebury and what we'll be doing in the future and how we'll be applying what we learn here to other sites. Um, because there is tree removal, there's a vegetation management plan. Um, there's a lot of educational outreach. There has been such incredible excitement from from homeowners and people who I you know have been watching bats there for years but you know we thought this was this big discovery and people are running out of their houses saying oh we're so glad you found it we knew there were all these bats here um, so there's been a lot a lot of really good public engagement and involvement in this project um, because of the loss of roosting habitat um, there will be six artificial roosts installed and there will be three different models we're putting two 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 of each in there so we have rocket boxes. Um, four chambered nurseries, and then two roosts that have artificial bark. We have temperature monitors in them. VHB will be helping out significantly with this uh, moving forward this summer. And we'll be monitoring the temperatures and coupling that with data to see which bats are using it, which bats aren't, and what can we do differently or better at other projects. We'll also be collecting guano and sending it in for analysis. And um, basically this is probably the most applied project that demonstrates collaboration through, um, I'm sorry, conservation through collaboration between a lot of different a lot of different parties and um, even what um, Bill Kilpatrick was saying about disease transmission, like all of his work and it, it feeds into how we operate and how we all work together. So we're agencies and, you know, consulting firms and large organizations, but what, what can anyone, you know, on this call do that's at home? Maybe you have property or maybe you don't have property. Maybe you're renting an apartment. There's so much you can do. There's just, it's like endless. Um, so Alyssa had mentioned, if you have a dead tree in your yard or you know of a neighbor who has a dead tree and it might have exfoliating bark or a cavity, or in some point it might, if it's not a hazard tree, then just, just leave it. It might be really helpful for bats. Um, removing any trees or cutting or limbing in the winter is the best bet. That way you can avoid um, disturbing disturbance to bat during the summer when um, they're active on the landscape. Installing bat houses, especially if that's coupled, if trees have to be removed, it provides an alternative place to roost. And um, Alyssa had mentioned that Vermont Fish and Wildlife has a, an enormous effort of monitoring maternity roosts. And um, there's often, from my understanding, um, not enough people to really get as much survey work in as all of us would like. So volunteering for Vermont Fish and Wildlife is a great way to help out. Um, if you're interested in joining um, 
the Northeast Bat Working Group or the Vermont Bat Working Group, there's really little obligation. It's just a way to interact with other people and keep you apprised of what's happening with bats and conservation and the latest and the greatest. Um, you can follow the Vermont Bat Center on Facebook and keep in touch with what Barry's doing and um, just don't touch bats if you find them call Barry at the Bat Center or, or Alyssa or anyone who can direct you to the right place. Um, if you touch a bat as cute as you might think it is, if it does have rabies, most bats don't carry rabies, but if it does, the best interest is gonna be in protecting you. So that bat will have to be euthanized to test its brain tissue to see if it does have rabies so that you can have the proper treatment. Um, so don't touch bats, just contact the right people and just spread the good word. Bats can get a bad rap sometime, but they're, they're really magnificent animals and they do a lot for us and we need them and um, they need us. So thanks for listening. I don't know if I have time, but I can answer any questions if there are any. Um, I just have two clarifying. Um, the first one is from Chris Smith and he was wondering if the bats are using those mostly submerged culverts or are they using the surrounding habitat um, from your previous picture? That's a very good question. My understanding is that there are not bats in Vermont that use culverts. That's generally um, much more common in other states, especially down south where it's warmer. Um, VTrans assumes doesn't, we, we will always assume that it is potential habitat until we look at it and determine that there are no cracks or crevices and make sure that it's not submerged in water. But typically, um, I think it's safe to say in Vermont, it's the surrounding habitat. They might be using the area as like, a flight corridor or a place to go foraging or just passing through between roosting and foraging areas. Wonderful. And then Courtney Dobbins would like to know how dangerous is it to inhale undisturbed guano? Um, she's working on an old building, an old schoolhouse, and they can see guano um, on ledges and inside grates around the chimney. It sounds like something Alyssa Bennett would be very excited to get her hands on and put in a bag. All right, <laughs> we'll address that in a QA. <laughs> um, um, I'm honestly, I'm not an expert at inhaling guano, but I, I, it's not safe. It's not good for you. I would definitely consider wearing a mask and protecting yourself, double mask up. Um, yeah, it's not healthy. I don't know if there's a certain threshold where it's, you know, more dangerous than not, but that might be something um, you could follow up with Alyssa on or maybe Barry. I don't think I'm an expert at that right now, but um, I would say just use the most caution that you can because it's not good for you. All right, thank you, Meg. <clears throat> You're welcome, thanks. Thank you. And now to um, wrap things up or bring us home, I guess you could say, we've got Barry up. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So, in order to understand how COVID-19 has impacted bat rehabilitation, I thought it would be good to talk about what bat rehabbers had to do before COVID-19 hit so that you could get some idea of how things changed. Now, unlike uh, our, our previous presenters, bat rehabilitation is pretty boring. I, I learn more from listening to the other three presenters in this segment than I can imagine, and now I have a headache. So I'm gonna talk about what it was like pre-COVID-19 in the world of bat rehabbers and what did we have to do when a bat, uh, someone called about a bat and said, we got a bat, what do we do? So <clears throat> prior to, whoops, wait a minute. There we go. Prior to COVID-19, the major concern about bats interacting with humans was rabies. The transmission of rabies through direct contact with a bat. So we as rehabbers had to ask certain questions that weren't um, too difficult for people to answer. And it gave us an idea of was there any concern about rabies? So we asked things like, did the uh, bat 
bite anybody, scratch anybody, lick anybody? Did anyone come in direct contact with the bat? Was there any physical contact observed between this bat and any of the pets that might be in the house, uh, cats or dogs or rabbits? Uh, was the bat an imminent threat to humans or domestic animals? These are, are fairly easy questions for the individuals to identify. And was the bat found in a room with a sleeping person or a child or an incapacitated person? Those are important questions. If, if the person was sleeping and they woke up to find a bat flying around, they don't know whether they came in contact with the bat or not. So those are the kind of questions that we had to ask prior to COVID-19 coming along. Because the issue was always, did the human come in contact with the bat which might have been a rabid bat. So that was a fairly easy set of questions. So now, since COVID-19, what has changed? Well, now we have a whole different set of things we have to be concerned about. Not because bats are gonna give something to humans, but because humans might have been infected with the COVID virus and give it to our North American bats. So our concern is that North American bats that have not ever been exposed to the virus could now be exposed. And we know how easily the COVID virus can be spread from one person to another. So we, we have to be certain that we are not passing the virus to bats just in the same way we would be cautious about passing it to humans. And it's it's difficult to detect the virus. Virus detection uh, in bats has to be done in the same way as virus detection in the humans. If we're looking for COVID, we do tests for COVID. So what about the case where here we are in our little closed environment at the Vermont Bat Center, and we have 50 bats that came to us prior to the arrival of COVID-19. They came to us in November and December of 2019, and they were with us in 2019 into 2020, January and February. And then along comes the coronavirus and everything changes because suddenly the ruling is no intake of any new bats because we don't want exposure to the COVID-19 virus from humans. But what about those that we already had? They were with us before the virus got here. They had been in our facility, in our hibernation area. Both my wife and I were in isolation from the very beginning because she has a severe chronic lung problem. So here we have these bats that have been with us. We have not been exposed to COVID. The bats at the center have not been exposed to COVID. Nobody comes into the center. What do we do? So the original protocol said we can't release these bats because they might have been exposed to COVID. And yet our bats had been in isolation since uh, the beginning. So along comes this magical way of determining whether or not our bats have COVID. Uh, Tufts University had a program going on where they could actually test bats to get a, uh, a sampling, a pallet sampling from the bats and test it to see whether the bats were exposed to COVID. So uh, we consulted all of the organizations that needed consulting. If we get the tests and they're all negative for all 50 of the bats that we have, can we release them in the spring? And the answer was yes, because they had been so isolated from pre-COVID time, yes, we can release them uh, if they all test negative. So we got the test kits, we sent them off to Tufts, we got the result back the next day that said all your bats are negative and now we can begin preparing them for relief. So authorization was given and we were very happy about that because we didn't have to keep 50 bats all summer long. That would be tough. So what do we need to get from the individuals now? Somebody calls us up and says, we have a bat. 
what can we do? And back pre-COVID, we asked them about the whole rabies thing, but now we have to ask them about some medical information that they may or may not be interested in giving. And we don't have uh, any authority to say, you must tell us whether you've been exposed to COVID. We have to ask them, would you be interested in taking part of, in a study to determine whether or not uh, COVID has been passed to bats? So we have some questions to ask them about whether or not they have come in contact with anybody that had COVID, have they had COVID? Uh, do they have any symptoms? Uh, so those are the things that we could get information from if they wanted to take part. So uh, we now have in our hibernation area, we have 85 bats that have come in since COVID. That 50 that we had before were all released in the spring and now we've got 85 new intakes and all of those came to us we asked the questions where people would give us the answers. And fortunately, not a single person out of all those who sent us bats, not one said, nope, I'm not gonna tell you anything. Now, whether they told us the truth or not, that's a whole nother thing. But we assume when we asked them those questions about have you been exposed, they were telling us the truth. So we took the bats in and immediately upon intake, they all got a swab, uh, that pallet swab with a little tiny uh, Q-tip. They got a pallet swab that was immediately frozen and the next day it was sent FedEx down to Tufts and the next day we got a result that said your bat is either positive or negative for COVID. So in this in, uh, particular instance, every single one of our 85 intakes all tested negative for COVID. So again, we have a large collection of bats, but that whole new set of questions that we had to ask uh, created a, a whole different level. In addition to that, we have had we have had at the center nobody come in for a visit. We have not had any uh, people who wanted to learn about rat re re bat rehabilitation come into the center. With one exception, we had one other person who had been in isolation, and they were interested in uh, learning more about bat rehabilitation and. Uh, possibly becoming a bat rehabilitator. So we did let them come in, uh, but when they came in, they were double masked with gloves, a gown, and completely removed from any contact with the bats that we had. So uh, our, our new screening process is in effect. We ask the uh, appropriate questions to determine whether the bat has been exposed. When we get them in, once they are at the center, we handle them with gloves, masks, and gowns on until we get that uh, initial test result back from Tufts. And fortunately, that is a very quick turnaround. So we are able to find out quickly whether or not we have a problem bad. And prior to getting that result back, any new incomes, uh, intakes are kept separate from all the other bats that might uh, be in the center. And if they are negative, we treat them uh, as normal. If they are positive cases for uh, COVID, then we have to euthanize them because we don't have any way of curing COVID in a bat. Um, and negative uh, any of our negative cases are treated the same way we would treat any other bats. We make sure they're healthy. If they're injured, we treat the injuries. Um, all, all the things that we would normally do. And then, <clears throat> When we get ready for release at the end of April this year, we will have all of the bats, 85 tests will be done in one day, 85 results will be FedEx down to Tufts, and they will tell us whether or not anybody has turned positive from the time that we got them. That would be a big disaster since they have all been in the same hibernation area. So but that would not be a fun time for us if we had bats turn out to be positive, and then the order had to be given to use an all. That I would not be a happy camper. So safety protocols that we have in place all the time at the center now. We follow all white nose syndrome protocols that we've been following right along for any cave bats that may have been exposed to white nose. We have to deal with that. We have to deal with a rabies issue. 
We can have no volunteers or visitors at the center. Uh, prospective rehabbers that might be allowed into the center will be in full gloves, masks, gowns, and not be any allowed anywhere near the bats themselves. They can come in and observe and learn, but they can't interact with the bats at all. We isolate new intakes. We get that negative test. Now we can deal with the bats. And one of the things that we have always done, but now do even more, is sanitize. We constantly, Clorox wipes, cage sanitizing with Clorox sprays, um, gloves over and over again. And, and anything that we use to work with one bat gets sanitized before it goes to, the, to another bat. So when we are doing feeding, gloves get uh, Clorox. Every time we handle a bat between one bat and the next bat, everything gets Clorox again. So that gives us a wide uh, uh, variety of things that we have to do now that we didn't have to do before. Before it was just be careful. Uh, if there is white nose concerns or rabies concerns, deal with those, but now we've got a whole new level. So be happy to take questions. Wonderful. Um, so Dr. Kilpatrick actually would like to know, is Tufts University paying for the testing and shipping of those samples, or is that being funded by you guys? That is all being covered by Tufts. Fantastic. Yeah, we like that. Yeah, that's incredible. Um, and then a second follow-up question by Kathy Keenan. What do you feed the rehab bats and when will the pregnant ones give birth? We feed bats mealworms and order them 5,000 at a time. Uh, when we prepare this group that we have for release in the spring, uh, we will wake them all up out of the hibernation area and start feeding them. They will eat approximately 25 bats a day for three days as we try and give them a good feeding before release. So we will go through thousands of mealworms in a hurry. Wonderful. And I'm sure there's going to be even more information about that for our next um, panel with you. Um, yes. Going through all that information. Yes. Great. So that was um, the only follow-up question for you guys. Um, Sarah, I'm ready to kind of go through the questions in our general Q&A. Yeah, take it away, Kim. Thank you. Wonderful. All right. So um, I do want to bring everyone's attention to uh, the chat, um, Alyssa is sharing a lot of really great links, information um, that I'm sure you would all find very, very helpful as we kind of go through all this information that we have just heard. Um, so I'm just going to go through my list here um, with each person, but if anyone else has any knowledge they'd like to share, you are more than welcome to. Um, so first for Dr. Kilpatrick, uh, Quentin Blaine would like to know, are there any connections between coronavirus and white nose syndrome? Um, perhaps are bats more likely to have one if they have the other? Um, is there any similarities between those two types of um, disease, diseases, for lack of a better word? Yeah, there's, there's no relationship that are known between the two. Um, certainly the, the bats that carry the SARS-like coronavirus are primarily found in, in Asia, uh, whereas white nose syndrome is known from North America and seemed historically, well, still occurs in, in Europe as well, but there doesn't seem to be a relationship. However, it's, you know, white nose syndrome probably is one of those things that spread by increased globalization possibly moving in from, from Europe into North America. So increased population, human population, movement of individuals, invasive species, including the fungi uh, that causes white nose syndrome, probably are all stressors that impact bat populations. Wonderful. Um, and there is another question from an anonymous viewer. How many viruses that transfer to humans from bats also kill those bats? Um, or are those reservoirs immune to that virus? Yeah, the, the idea of reservoirs 
generally is the reservoir is not killed by the virus. It may be made sick by the virus, but that's not a good evolutionary strategy for the virus to kill its, its reservoir. If it does, it dies out. Uh, so usually there's this coevolution between the virus and its, and its host. So they both can exist and, and the virus will be maintained. So in the case of the SARS-like bat COVID viruses, um, the bats don't even appear to be ill. So uh, they're just shedding the virus uh, uh, both in, in through their particles uh, through respiration as well as through fecal material that's being shed. Great, thank you so much. Um, so Alyssa, I see you are typing away in that chat. Um, a couple of questions for you specifically. Um, one is from Leanne Avery. Are there similar species of bats in New Hampshire as there are in Vermont? Um, since most wildlife don't recognize our human borders, um, are we seeing those same species being affected in similar manners? Yes, I always like to say bats don't recognize political boundaries. That's very true. And as flying animals, they can travel quite some distance, um, hundreds of thousands of miles between their summer and winter range. But New Hampshire has eight of our nine species. The only species of bat they don't have is the Indiana bat because we are actually at the northeast corner of their range, which may in fact change with climate change. Oh, another interesting, interesting topic. Um, and then Barbara, Harai would like to know, are there tree species that our tree roosting bats prefer? Um, and that if you were to have them on your property, perhaps it'd be a really good way to conserve and help those bats out. For some species, they are very picky about the trees they use. Indiana bats really preferentially roost in live shag bark hickory trees because they have peeling bark that makes a nice roof-like pattern those bats use. They also will use black locust trees and a number of other, of other bats could use these tree species. In terms of bats that like to uh, roost in cavities and trees with peeling bark because they're dead or dying, th that could be just about any tree species, but we've noticed that American elm and ash trees certainly tend to form that peeling bark as well as uh, white pine when they die. Those are three species that certainly stand out as having some big sloughing bark that bats can crawl up under, but certainly anything where a cavity forms like a red maple or something that rots out on the inside pretty quickly can become a good bat roost. So species of tree, not as important for some of our bats as the, um, the, the features that the trees have. In addition, those, uh, those bats that fly the long distances, the migratory tree bats, they tend to roost just hanging in the foliage as well as tricolored bats. So those bats will just hang in a variety of different trees and hide within the foliage there around, along the leaf petiole. And again, I'm not sure that tree species is quite as important for those individual roost trees, although there's some associations with, with forest stand type in some cases. Wonderful. Um, and then several people were wondering some upkeep about bat houses. Um, and about if they should be cleaned out each year, what to use if that's the case uh, and when that should be done. Yep, apparently we have a YouTube channel, which I just found out about Fish, Vermont Fish and Wildlife YouTube channel. Um, we did some outreach, which actually does have a lot to do with COVID. So when COVID hit, bats were getting a lot of bad press. So I think a lot of us really tried to figure out how we could make some good press for bats. We made a few outreach videos. One of those is about how to clean your bat house. So I think you can find that on the channel, but using something like a thin long stick to do that work before your bats have returned this time of year would be fine for little brown bat, bat houses. For big brown bats, you might find that some of them already have come back to your bat house. So doing that work in the winter after they've left or early, early in the spring before the bats come back, but big browns might be in your house. So look up in there and see if anyone's inside before you poke around. But really you're just cleaning out wasps nests. I wouldn't put any water or any other chemicals in there. Wonderful. Um, so now these, Next couple questions are for anyone, um, since I think you all would have different takes and different insights. Um, so first up is Courtney Dobbins would like to know, uh, do bats hibernate inside attics in the winter um, in the Northeast and why do they prefer attics if they do? And also, is there a better time of the year to remove bats? I'm assuming we should call Barry for that, but 
is there a best time? Yeah, I think Barry could have some good input here too. We work together a lot on this. We'll get calls from the same people. So the reason Barry has a lot of bats overwintering is because they pop up in people's attics and basements and and walls sometimes throughout the winter. Big brown bats are the one species we find hibernating in buildings in Vermont. And pretty frequently we thought in only small numbers until he took in about 50, 60 bats from one location this winter where they were hibernating in one structure. So usually in just a couple bats, but sometimes a lot. And the question was, why are they in attics? Is that what it was? Yeah. Why are uh, they think- preferring attics than, you know, being outside? Uh, We don't really know. I would imagine that some combination of habitat loss and adaptation on the part of a species like a big brown bat, which seems to be really well adapted to living very close to people, has allowed them to take care, take advantage of this niche of, of staying close to people and using the ambient heat off of our living spaces so that they could find that little temperature range that they can hibernate in. They're pretty hardy animals. And spring and fall are the times that you would wanna do safe evictions. So I posted a link to the best management practices for how to do that. And I suspect Barry could add to some of this. One one of the interesting uh, situations that we find every year when we have in Vermont these temperature changes that go up into the 50s in January, and then two days later, it's 15 below, those bats that are are in people's attics, nice and comfortably snuggled down underneath the insulation, trying to sleep all winter, and these crazy temperature swings wake them up. It's no longer that nice, consistent temperature. So after we have one of these crazy temperature swings, we always get calls. There's a bat in my house. It's in my kitchen. It's in my bathroom. What do I do? Well, the reason it got in there is because the temperature changed in the attic and they were looking for a more consistent uh, temperature that was more to their liking. So they woke up, start wiggling around. They feel some warm air coming up from one of the vent pipes, maybe that goes down into the bathroom. So they follow the pipe down into the bathroom. And the next thing we get a call from somebody saying there's a bat in my toilet. Well, take it out. Wonderful. Um, And on a similar um, line, what's a really good way to keep bats such as the big brown bat out of someone's barn? That question's from Nancy Collier. Do you have any insight, anyone? (laughs) Barns are one of the greatest bat houses ever. They're big, they're easy to get in and out of. Uh, I think the best thing that you can do, one of the slides that Alyssa had, uh, the best thing that you can do is put a bat house up outside the barn, on the side of the barn that meets all of the conditions of being in the sun. And maybe it will be a nicer place for the bats than trying to get inside the barn. Uh, but that's the best you can do. Barns are just these wonderful, big open spaces. They're easy to fly around in. Uh, So bats love them. The one thing I would add there is that there is some idea that because um, bats in the summer like a hot space where there isn't a lot of air movement, or that seems to be what they select, um, Bat Conservation International years ago had kind of a summary of what to do with those types of spaces. And they recommended creating air movement. So pointing fans up towards the spaces where bats roost, especially if they're leaving droppings on something below where you don't want them, kind of pointing air up towards those spaces and doing that in the spring and early summer before the bats have their pups in there and you would be disturbing them to make that unsuitable. And you can also, I like the way they had this, you can create a party atmosphere. So if you can get up into the rafters and hang some balloons and streamers and then point the air at it, the bats are gonna have a real heck of a time landing up in the rafters there and getting into the roost space when they've got balloons moving around, dangling and blowing in the breeze. So that's what I suggest to people, but you've gotta be able to get up into your rafters. Wonderful. Anyone else on? best ways to to deter. Uh, We do have one question in the chat um, from Courtney Dobbins um, that is it good to use sonar boxes um, as a way to deter bats? And if so, is there any recommendation for a brand um, and are they effective? I can speak to that. I didn't know if Barry was gonna answer. Oh, go ahead, Meg, go. You guys can go first. No, I was just going to say that that 
for a deterrent, I know that there's a lot of research going on, especially at wind facilities where those um, deterrents are being put at the top of wind turbines on the nacelles to try and deter bats from coming closer to um, the rotor swept height to keep them away um, from the wind farm so that they don't get killed by the spinning blades or the air pressure changes. But um, I know that there's a lot of research going on about it and there's some very promising research that shows that they do work. Um, Rogan Morton is, um, I can't remember the name of his company, but he's in, based in Vermont and he has developed that kind of technology and he would be a good person. I, I don't know if Alyssa or Barry um, have any specifics on that, but I, I can provide his contact information and he would be able to tell you more. Yeah, that would be really great. Thank you, Meg. Sure. And I have one last question so far, um, but if anyone has any others, please throw them in the chat. Um, and I think this will be best for Barry. Um, Tara Torcoletti, excuse me, um, would like to know about any thoughts regarding the risk of returning, uh, returning to colonies this year if they were exposed to people in their houses that had been exposed to COVID um, and any type of transmission once they are released. Yeah, and um, Tara is somebody who has volunteered for us counting bats coming out of the structure. So thank you very much, Tara, for doing that work. Uh, uh, we really don't know exactly what the risk level might be. Um, Bill gave us a great background on what we do understand, but there are some big questions out there still. There has been a little bit of research work on trying to inoculate big brown bats. They do not seem readily susceptible to picking up the virus from people. But as you can tell, we're still using caution um, and Barry is getting those bats tested and we've still canceled our handling work. As you noticed in my slideshow, different bats respond differently to certain threats. So we had a variety of different responses of bats to white nose syndrome, and we would expect there could be different responses among species to COVID. So just because there's been some research done in big browns, it's hard for us to say whether little browns would or wouldn't be susceptible. However, most of these bats are roosting in spaces like attics that are isolated from where people are living in their living space. We generally don't get bats um, roosting in large numbers inside the living space. They're usually fairly isolated, just like you would quarantine in another room of your house if one person was infected with COVID that's following the CDC guidance. So I'm hoping there wouldn't be a concern. And we are gonna be able to do our roost monitoring this summer because um, you can stay at a social distance from the bats that you're counting as they exit from the structures. Great, and is that a really safe way to observe bats in their natural habitat when we get into our summer months? Yes, yes. that's a fantastic <laughs> thing to do. Yes, definitely. And if you can count, Alyssa wants you. Great, well, thank you guys. Um, I have one question that I always like to ask. Do you have a favorite type of bat and why? My favorite type of bat is a live bat. Oh, you took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> I would say the same thing. Um, uh, I would also sometimes say that my, my favorite bat is whatever one I'm learning new stuff about at the time suddenly becomes my new favorite. <laughs> well, my, my two favorites are uh, two highly specialized bats, the fishing bat that actually catches fish and eats them, and the common vampire bat who has been persecuted by living better through chemistry and still expands its range and its utility of finding resources. Two very adaptive bats. That is so great, you guys. Thank you so much. Um, Again, if anyone has any other questions, we'll be sticking on, I think, for a little bit longer, um, just so we can answer those as they come. Yeah. And I look forward to seeing you on the 15th. If anyone wants to stop in, uh, we'll talk more about bat houses, bat locations, uh, you know, bat house locations, um, bat species, uh, white nose fungus, uh, and the difference between a fungus and a virus, which is what we're talking about in those two things with the COVID and white nose. So uh, do come and join us on the 15th. Yes, we hope to see many of you back um, and have um, 
in two weeks, same time, same place, April 15th. Um, and I know we've got a little over. I appreciate everybody sticking around. Um, I hope it's well worth it and, and it's a fascinating topic. So again, much appreciated. And on behalf of VINS, I wanna thank um, Bill and Alyssa and Meg and Barry for their time this evening. Um, we feel very fortunate at VINS to have um, wonderful partners such as these individuals um, doing such amazing work at their organizations or um, their respective agencies. And so it was wonderful to have you all here in, in one place this evening, and we really appreciate that. Um, so thank you all. And um, I'm going to stick around a little bit longer to close out everything. And I think otherwise have a great evening. I did get one last question. Uh, Leanne Avery says, my aunt is always suggesting bats might eat ticks. Do they? My first, my first thought is because uh, bats mostly uh, take flying insects. Some species glean bugs off of leaves and things, but my first thought would be no. I agree. I don't think uh, bats are known to feed on ticks. Use possums instead. Possums are great tick feeders. Yep, I always love to uh, promote our opossum friends. Um, definitely ones that you should try to encourage to come to your property. Uh, they will eat thousands and thousands of ticks. All right, and Leanne, thank you, there. Kim. Yep, for moderating. Sure always a joy, you guys, and I'm really excited for the next one um, with Barry Center. All right, that's a wrap and I am going to stop the recording. Thanks again. Thank you.